Welcome to the Land Your Bet Sports Betting Show. Coming off a 4 and one night, baby. Feeling pretty good about Thursday here. That's when I'm recording this video for you for Friday. Slate is late night here on Thursday. Getting ahead of some early looks at this 10-game slate that we've got for you guys. Let's go ahead and get right into it so I can talk about my projections that I have here for Friday slate. 10 games, as you can see. We've got some back-to-backs to talk about here. On the back end on Friday will be Indy. They're playing versus Sack at home. They just came off a loss to the Knicks with a really nice victory for the Knicks to come back and win that one. Cleveland is going to be playing Memphis. Memphis is coming, or I'm sorry, Memphis and Cleveland played on Thursday, and then Memphis is playing Golden State at home once again on Friday. The front end teams here, we've got a couple of teams that are playing on Friday that will also be playing on Saturday. Important to keep that stuff in mind because sometimes guys rest on one end of the back-to-back. -back. Sometimes it's the front end and you have to be ready for that. You also have to realize when there's look-ahead spots where there's trap games and things of that nature. So Atlanta is playing a front end of a back-to-back -back here. They're playing Phoenix on Friday and then they play Golden State on Saturday. Golden State just is going to play Memphis on uh, Friday here and then play Atlanta on Saturday. You can see the rest here. Sacramento and Indy and then SAC is going to be at Chicago on Saturday and the Spurs versus the Pellies, and then the Pellies, uh, excuse me, and then the Spurs will be against the Cavs at home uh, on Saturday as well. Not much to glean from that because there's uh, some interesting stuff here. I'll be looking at uh, actually all of those games except for San Antonio here with you guys right now. So let's get right into it, kicking it off with that Suns and Hawks game. That is the first game of the night. A couple injuries that we already kind of know about. Damian Lee's been out. It doesn't matter, to be honest with you. DeAndre Hunter is going to be questionable for the Hawks and has been such for a while now. Hasn't been playing for, I believe, at least a month or so now that DeAndre Hunter's been out for the Hawks. So not much to take away from that. But here are some of the splits that we'll be looking at. And points seem like they're likely to come in this game, especially with the way that the Suns have been playing as of late. All these numbers for the Suns here, where they score 117 at home versus 115 that they give up at home. And then the 117 they also score on the road, which is what we have here, and 114 that they give up. When you have a 231 total that you're averaging for the Suns there and you're playing the Hawks, I, I can never take a, an under against the Hawks here. But with everybody playing for the Suns, I, like, I'm like i happy to take this three and a half. This has a very smelly line to it in a way that you're like, why? But there's nothing about the Hawks that I respect, to be honest with you. There's nothing that I would take away from the Hawks and the way that they've been playing even as of late to go, yeah, maybe they'll start covering all of a sudden and stop being the worst against the spread team in the league, which they are. Uh, and there's not much to take away from that except for they don't cover, man. Uh, they don't cover when they're the favorite. They don't cover when they're their dog at home, away with a mouse in a house. It doesn't matter for the Atlanta Hawks. They do not cover. So I'm not going to take them in a small spread as home dogs against the Suns. I don't care where they're playing. They're just as bad covering against uh, the spread as when at home as they are on the road. So I have, I have nothing else to say about Atlanta. I I'll be looking at some props. I, I just... I hate having to figure out who's going to go off for the Suns. And to be honest, like I don't really want to have to pick anything with the Hawks. I think they'll probably have a decent time scoring. They score a ton of points at home, as you can see. But they give up that 125 per game at home. Only a couple teams, uh, mostly just the Wizards, are worse than the Hawks at home on defense, if that helps you understand how bad they are. So I'm likely going to be hitting this Suns line at 3.5. I, I would imagine it's going to go up a bit. I don't think I'm the only one. I fear that the public will be on it too, and I hate when it's just all public money coming in on a bet, and then I have to hit it as well. So that's why I'm like, let me get this Suns bet in early. Uh, I haven't hit it yet before this video. It's 12.30 a.m. in the morning, but I am going to spend a little bit of time before I fall asleep uh, putting in a, a few of these bets, and this is uh, almost definitely going to be one. I, I can't imagine I'm going to find something that's going to tell me that minus three and a half for the Suns should be scary. So if I do, I'll let you know in the morning in that other video that comes out at 3 p.m. Eastern every day that has the final best bets and the picks that I'm playing after we get a few more of the injury reports final and stuff like that. I like to have this video to project what we're looking at for the next day, and then I bring out the, the final video there at 3 p.m. Eastern on the day of games to tell you how exactly I'm playing things. All right, game number two here is interesting because we've got the Kangs taking on the Pacers in Indiana. And of course, there was a trade that happened not that long ago where Tyrese Halliburton ended up on the Pacers. Domas Sabonis ended up on the Sacramento Kings. That's working out for him, even though he got snubbed badly from an all-star in this year uh, and for the Western Conference this season. But no players that are going to be injured necessarily just yet for the Kings. Well, the Kings we know are going to be healthy. The Pacers, we don't necessarily know. They just played that game against the Knicks. But they tried to win, but they still kept Tyrese Halliburton on that minutes restriction. So we don't really know if he's going to play in this back-to-back. The, the story with Halliburton is he really wants to play the, the necessary games, missing less than 18. So he has to play 65 games in order to qualify for all NBA teams, in order to qualify for clutch player of the year, most improved player of the year, things that he has legitimate odds to win. 
And if he doesn't play those 65 games, he doesn't get that. He doesn't get any of those awards. He misses out on a ton of bonuses that are in his contract. So they're playing him for 20 minutes a game. There's really not even a minimum you have to play him as long as he steps foot on the floor, I believe, for like, I, I don't even know if there's a minutes restriction, uh, minutes limit at all so that you qualify for a game played. But he's making sure that he gets a game played in and then sitting out for the majority of the rest of the game after maybe 19 minutes. I think that's what he played against the Knicks tonight. And that's going to be a problem for, for that team if they want to score points. It was very interesting to watch what happened in that game. You know, I'll get right into some of these stats too because what happened in the game against the Knicks was that, th that game was going at like 104 pace. There was a ton of points. It was on pace to score probably like 240, 235 in that range. Tyrese Halliburton comes out. Everything slows down. Plus, teams know that they don't really need to run with the Pacers because they can beat them if they slow it down. The Kings don't really have a choice. I know they want to speed it up. But they're not the same team on the road. They play slower for a reason. As you can see, the 99.8 versus 106, 100.6 pace is in part because they can't afford to just play helter-skelter on offense the way that they do at home because they don't make the same amount of shots. It's just that simple. Too many dip, like massive differences between in, in the shooting splits between guys playing on these Kings when they're in Sacramento versus when they're on the road. So that's why I don't like Kings games to score a lot of points on the road. Obviously, you see here they're at a 230 total when they play on the road versus 242 when they play at home. I get that these teams want to play face, fast pace in general, but Halliburton is either going to be on a restrictions uh, minutes restriction or he's not going to play in this game because they can't afford to bring him back too early and risk actual injury with their best player and all-world point guard, right? So it makes total sense that, that they won't have him. And as soon as he's off the floor, man, everything changes. That's what I said about the Knicks game. Why well, I took a nice under in that one, uh, simply because th when he's not on the floor, everything slows down. Bruce Brown, I've said this all as well, was the reason that this team was playing fast, even when Halliburton was off the floor. He's not there anymore. Now you've got Pascal, much slower approach to the game and on offense, especially for Pascal Siakam than guys like Bruce Brown. So I throw these numbers at you here for the Pacers because they're the last 10 for them. And that's much more important to me than everything they were doing before Halliburton got this injury, before they let go of uh, Bruce Brown so that they could bring in Pascal Siakam and the like, right? So that's why this everything is a bit different here. And I think we're getting amazing value at 247 and a half to go under in this one. That's where I'm strongly leaning. I still haven't bet that one, but looking to do that pretty soon here. All right, for the Orlando Magic and the Timberwolves, not a sexy game by any means. It's at 212 and a half total because these are two of the best defensive teams in the league. And the Magic are at seven and a half dogs in Minnesota. There's nobody really hurt to talk about for this game. So let's just get into some of the splits for this teams, these teams. And then I have a few bits more of, of information that I think is really key before betting on this game. If you're looking at these home road splits, I kind of don't really care right now. Uh, if you look at the, the way the Magic are playing, uh, they're, they're scoring more points at home, allowing more points on the road. That makes total sense, uh, but that has not been the case for them as of late. Before moving on, just to be very clear, the Wolves are the best defensive team at home, even though the Knicks have been out of this world since they got OG and Anobi. This is still the team with like 104 defensive rating at home. They're killing it. Um, so you do not score points on them when they are playing at home. Plenty of teams score under 110 when they play this team at home. Um, but that said, Orlando has been playing much faster and playing worse defense on the road as of late. Um, in the last 15 games, or excuse me, not 15, yeah, the last 25 games, rather, I should say, since December 15th, they're not good. Um, and I know Franz missed about a week or two in there, and so that definitely skews things. He's back now. Things are going to start back, coming back into motion. But I also expect this team to backslide a bit moving forward. Like, the trajectory for them is kind of coming down, and the heat is going up, and that division is probably going to end up in the heat's control. So at, with this one, I'm still kind of riding that wave with them. This is not a good like get right spot for them because of how much they need to score inside, right? They, they, they rely on driving to the basket. They drive to the basket more than any other team. Um, they get into the lane, try to score inside the paint as much, if not more than most, well, mo most teams in the league. Uh, they're in the top five in terms of the percentage of their points that they're scoring inside of about 15 feet. There's not that many threes coming from this team. So it's not like threes would help them against Minnesota, who's an incredible perimeter defense, but the strength of their defense is down low. And if that's where the Magic are going to try to score, I think they're going to continue to be in trouble. All of that said, these two teams, when they played each other over the last couple times, have gone over pretty considerably. Different lineups. We had a, a D'Lo sighting on the T-Wolves the last time that they played. No cat in that game. So things were a little bit more open offensively as well uh, for the Minnesota Timberwolves at the time and definitely worse defensively. All of that said, still, I kind of like an over in this game. That's my strong lean in this one is 212 and a half. 
over that in this one because I, I understand how good this Timberwolves de team has been on defense. Um, and I understand that the Magic have been good on defense and absolutely putrid on offense. But like I said, I think we're still getting some, some value here because of the fact that Franz was out for a while. Everybody's back for this Magic team. They're fully healthy. And as good as Paolo has been and will probably continue to be in his career, he wasn't really able to carry an entire offense by himself. And I don't know. And, and now that he doesn't have to, I believe in them a bit more, right? They scored 92 points the last time that these two teams played. And I don't really care that much about that because it was not the same lineups that we're going to see here tonight. So I lean over 212 and a half in this game. Once again, subscribe to that page because tomorrow I will be bringing you guys, well, today when you're watching it, I will be bringing you guys a video with all of my best bets, which went four and one today. We're 12 and seven the last, uh, well, four nights because this week we're 12 and seven up 3.9 units. That's a good amount of money per week if you're trying to win out here in this NBA season. So we'll keep trucking along here. This is the final game I've got. One more lean that I'm going to bring you, well, two more leans that I'm going to bring you from this game. The Warriors and the Grizz. Uh, man, I, I hate the Warriors as six and a half point favorites, but we'll talk about it. The uh, They are that, and 223 and a half is the total here. Bunch of guys out, but we already kind of knew that. Dario Saric is, I'm sorry, Saric is the most recent uh, addition to this injury report for the Dubs. Chris Paul is out still, Moses Moody out still, and Gary Payton Jr. is out still, or the second, whatever he prefers. The Grizz have not yet submitted theirs because they just got done losing to the Cavs at home by seven points. And a couple players who missed Thursday that could play on Friday would be Kennard and Zaire Williams. But if you do want to spend the the long, I don't, it's like a 10 minute read if you want to read this injury report for the Grizzlies because everybody's hurt. So uh, I, I just don't know who's going to play between the guys that are might be available. And that would be these two right here, Kennard and Zaire Williams. Don't know if, if somebody else is going to sit. I don't know why you would sit anybody on this team. Like there's nobody that you're trying to protect for your playoff run if you're the Grizzlies. So I would imagine that the guys that played on Thursday will also play on Friday, and maybe you get Kennard and Zaire Williams back. Either way, sad story right now in Memphis. Uh, they've been a nice sort of like spunky team that comes out and surprises you, like they had the nice win against the Heat the other night. That doesn't really matter to me. Um, they almost covered against Minnesota and then didn't. You know, like they're 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 fighting hard. They're never going to give up. Taylor Jenkins is a great coach. Uh, and Triple J continues to like outshine himself, I guess, in his past and the way he has been on offense. But it's all empty calories. It all means nothing. Um, and I, I think the Dubs are in a place right now that they do want to win. So why am I taking Golden State to win by six, but Steph Curry to score under 30? Because I don't really think that this is a good, it's just not a good situation for him. I don't know why he would go that hard. So I have to look a bit more into it. Memphis has been good defending the three. They've been good defending point guards. This is not a dude that you care about what the recent stats were, though. Like, Steph is one of those dudes that defies whatever the recent history was or how well a team might be defending the three. It doesn't matter when you meet Steph Curry shooting threes. Like, Steph shooting threes is not whoever you recently uh, withheld from shooting threes, right? He's a different story entirely. So he, he the, the whole thing, though, is why would he? Like, what does, he doesn't need to do that for them to win. Jonathan Kaminga continues to be uh, the guy that that really is carrying this team at the end of games. And he is, especially in a matchup where this team is vulnerable down low. The Grizzlies are are much better defending the the, uh, the perimeter right now than they are the paint. The Dubs need to score from the perimeter. So, I mean, or, uh, they want to score from the perimeter, but guys like Jonathan Kaminga, now that they're finally getting their run, are going to the basket uh, and getting a bit more points in the paint for this team. So I think that's going to be a bit available for the Dubs. I think that's how they'll try to win, and other guys will help uh, in the scoring a lot to keep Seth from having to get 30, even though he's gone off as of late. He hasn't really done it on the road, and he hasn't done it against bad teams. He's only gone off against good teams. If you look at Steph's last, like, five games, he's gone off against, like, Lakers. He went off against uh, the who are the other teams here. I've already lost my place, but they're, they're all good, I assure you. Uh, the Clips were in there, so... Steph's been going off against good teams, not really needing to bring it against bad teams, get a bit more minutes for the young guys in there against teams like Memphis, and I could see that happening. I lean minus six, but that feels a little bit trappy. It's just like, dude, there's not going to be anybody left for this Grizzlies team if anybody sits. Vince Williams was recently dealing with an injury. He might sit on the second leg of a back-to-back, -back, so it's just got like complete marauding written all over it for this Dubs team that I think is going to happen. So... That's my final lean here. One more reminder to go ahead and subscribe to that page as I bring you out these videos on at 3 p.m. on the day of games. So tomorrow I'll have that out for you at 3 p.m. with my five, most likely five. Don't hold me to it. Might be a few less, might be a few more. I'm, I'm really liking this slate with all 10 games here. So if I can get some injury reports out early enough to like know who's actually in, I would love to get seven picks your guys' way 
for that video tomorrow. Also have College Hoops out and Oaks is going to be bringing you that for a big Saturday slate. He's been doing a great job bringing you guys these videos twice a week for these College Hoops picks that he's got. So continue to follow along. As I said, best of luck on Friday and I will see y'all at 3 p.m. And until then, happy betting.